Hello, this is Mike Dixon, and this is the Bolivia Baptist Wednesday Night Bible Study for December 2nd, 2020. We're always grateful to find out that our kids haven't taken part when their friends are ridiculing someone. However, we're thrilled when they defend the person being teased and let their friends know that humiliating a person is unacceptable. Not doing what is wrong is one thing, but sometimes it can be even more difficult to do what is right. How do children imitate? Have you noticed raising children, watching how they grow, how much they're imitating what you do? The way they talk, the way they eat, the way they react to certain situations, they're watching what you do when certain things happen. That way they know how they should act. It's important to spend as much time as you can around your children because that's how they grow. That's how they learn to live the right way, how they learn to act the right way. It's important for them to see you and what you do because your children are always imitating you. Think about people that you'd like to imitate. What makes you want to imitate them? For me personally, I think of wise people, um, spiritually strong people that I look up to, people that are in the word all the time, that are in prayer all the time. To me, those are the people that I want to imitate. Those are people that shine light. And I hope one day that I can too. In Ephesians 5, Paul continues to outline what it means to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. He does this by considering ways we shouldn't act and ways we should. Just as children imitate their parents, so we are to imitate God. I'm going to read Ephesians 5, 1 through 20. Follow along with me. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality, or any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Verse 8. For you were once in darkness, but now you are in light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret, but everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. That is why it is said, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What would it be like to imitate God in some way? How would you imitate God? I can't even imagine. I, I can't even begin to answer that question. I, I don't know how to imitate God. But according to verse 2, Christ is the perfect example of imitating God by living a life of love. So you see, Christ has showed us how we imitate God. We live a life of love. Christ knew that the Father loved humanity and wanted to save them, and Christ knew that he was a way that could do it. He willingly went to the cross in order to please the Father. And for us, his life was a life of love. That's how we imitate God. We live a life like Christ, someone who's so full of love that they're willing to sacrifice. What difference does it make to you that Christ has gone before you in living this life? If this was something that we had no example of, if this is something that we had no concept of, it would be very difficult, but we know that Christ has gone before us. We know that he's prepared a way. And because he was crucified and resurrected, he's now in every believer, guiding us along on the walk. What behaviors does Paul condemn in verses 3 and 4? Look at that. 
there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. Not even a little bit, <laughs> Paul says. Um, and that's a shocking statement in 2020. Um, there shouldn't be any. There should be no kind of impurity, no greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Consider that. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking, and these are all uh, sins of the mouth. These are all things that are said, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. It's odd that he contrasts the first group with thanksgiving. In other words, he's offering thanksgiving as a replacement. Instead of acting this way, and instead of talking this way, use your hands and your mouth to give thanks. How is thanksgiving an appropriate replacement for the behavior he condemns? We spoke about this last Sunday you know, on the concept of living a life of gratitude. A grateful person is humble, and they're happy with what they've been given. If you have a heart of gratitude and you, and you live a life of gratitude and of graciousness, you're not someone that says evil things. You're someone whose mouth and body is used for good because of the joy in your own heart. When we find the gratitude that comes along with being a believer with everything that God has given us, well, it changes your perception and you'll start to live in a different way. In verses 5 and 7, there's a couple of things that cause confusion for many people. Um, and he says, you can, for, in verse 5, For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. So where does that leave us? How many of us are immoral? Have you um, done anything that might cause you to be impure? Have you ever done something that was greedy? I have. You know, um, I don't have an, I don't, I'm not going to heaven. I'll say this, um, at this time, the Gnostics were everywhere, it had spread, and they had doctrine that basically said, your sins don't matter. Now, that's wrong, and Paul spends a lot of time arguing why it's wrong, and that's why this is here now. It's funny that that doctrine has infected the modern church, particularly in America. I can't tell you how many Christians I meet who say, Sins don't matter because we've been saved. Well, Paul disagrees here. So is Paul saying that we're saved by works? Or are the others right who say we're saved by grace and our actions don't matter? Well, neither of those is right. Paul is not talking about our salvation. Paul is talking about your inheritance in the kingdom. He explains later that when you get there, you're, there's going to be a trial by fire. And all of the wood and stubble and hay is going to burn away. And all that's going to be left is your jewels. We've spent our life basically loading up a wheelbarrow. And if you spent your life throwing hay in there because you've lived selfishly and in, in, in evil, you're not going to have a lot of left. There's people who live pure lives and who serve the Lord and love Him and spend their lives doing good. They've got a lot of jewels in that wheelbarrow. So they're going to have a bigger inheritance. It's very clear in the Bible that there are rewards given in heaven based upon your actions. It's not talking about salvation. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to heaven. You're going to be saved. But your reward, once you get there, is determined by what you do. And what Paul is saying here is, listen, your actions matter. Don't listen to the Gnostics who tell you that sin doesn't matter. It does. It matters here, and it matters later. Because he says, let no one deceive you with empty words in verse 6. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Have you experienced God's wrath because you weren't living correctly? Yeah, I have. And God disciplines those that he loves. So when you're living incorrectly, he punishes, punishes you for it um, because you're being disobedient. And it matters. It matters right now. And it matters after you get to heaven. Because I know that when I'm standing there, I'm going to wish that I had lived better. I'm going to wish that I had done more. Why are such people considered idolaters? Why are they an idolater? What are these people doing? 
they're serving themselves. The number one God in this country, in the West, is mankind. Humans love themselves, and they worship themselves, and they, do, they spend every single day giving their God what that God wants, whatever it wants, whether it's sexual impurity or whether it's drugs or whether it's drink or whether it's anger or whether it's money. They're constantly offering gifts to their God, and they are their own God. Many atheists, when you talk to them, this becomes very clear. It's not that they don't believe in God, it's that they don't want God. They want to serve themselves. In verses 8 through 14, Paul contrasts light and darkness to say more about holy living. According to these verses, what does it mean to live as children of the light? What does it mean to live in the light? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, People do things in the dark that they don't want anyone to know. How much of your life would you want to be on national television? <laughs> How much of your average day would you want to be on national television? If you live as a child of light, you won't care because everything that you do is good. The things that you say is good. The things that you do is good. You're quite confident having all of those things exposed to the light, but if a lot of what you're doing needs to be hidden and kept from people, then you're in trouble. You're not living as a child of light. Children of light live holy lives, and they're not afraid to let that shine. And where they shine, other people become light. In what ways do you struggle living as a child of light? In what ways is it hard for you? Consider that. Often we equate wisdom with intelligence, but Paul in verses 15 through 17 explains it differently. Be very careful then how you live. Don't live as unwise, but live as wise people, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Isn't that true today? Don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. You know, the Holy Spirit is telling you what God's will is, and God has a will for your life. And he's telling you every day what he wants you to do. It's wise to follow that. That's not intelligence. A simple person can do that. God has all the intelligence I need. My intelligence could never compare to his. So it behooves me to listen and to do what he says. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine. There's many people today that say drinking's okay. Paul clearly says here, it may be okay to drink a beer, but it is not okay to get drunk. <laughs> and how much do you drink before you start feeling it? Do not, point blank, do not get drunk on wine. That leads to debauchery because once you lose control of yourself, the Holy Spirit's not going to be able to help you. Your body's going to take over. Instead, he says, be filled with the Spirit. Why does Paul say that? Well, he's contrasting. Listen, you go to drink because you want to feel good, but doesn't the Holy Spirit make you feel good? Every single one of us who've experienced Him filling us knows what a great feeling that is. How good it feels to have the Lord near you. That is a much better feeling, a much cleaner, a much purer feeling than drinking or doing drugs. Um, it doesn't take a lot to be filled with the Spirit. One sure way is to live purely. I've noticed that when I allow my anger or my tongue to take over, I feel that lessening, and I feel the Holy Spirit get distance. And as someone always tells me, it's not God leaving, it's me. So living purely and following His will is a sure way to be filled with the Spirit and to stay filled with the Spirit. Listen, this week, I want you to talk to God as a child to a father, the way that you would talk to your dad. Talk to him and tell him how you would like to imitate him. And if possible, spend some time singing and making music in your heart to the Lord this week. Write a psalm of your own, expressing to God your gratitude to him for the life he has called you to live. That's all for today. I hope you have a blessed rest of your week.